I think in order to understand a culture, you should learn the language and you should eat the food. And uh, I think these Chinese restaurants around the world, not just in America, but also in Canada, Mexico, because this book, American Chinese Restaurant, that's edited by myself and Hai Ming Liu, it's not just uh, a USA story. It's a, you know, it's a Latin American story. Chinese restaurants are all over Latin America, right? Wow. Uh, it's a huge th uh, restaurant. Uh, they have shaped and uh, impacted Peru, Argentina, uh, Chile, and these are not in the discourse. And um, so Alan, the reason why I also wanted to edit this book was because every time I read, as an academic, I would read these like stories of racism on Chinese you know, restaurateurs, you know, they weren't allowed, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act that excluded Chinese people from coming to the U.S. That's true, and, and all these things are right. And I would read these these things, and they would mention Chinese restaurants as the way how the restaurant workers, I'm sorry, the railroad workers, after they were done with the railroad, they couldn't back, go back to China, so they started Chinese restaurants. And I thought that was an interesting story, and definitely interesting. But I, having ra been raised in a Chinese restaurant, knew that there are so many other stories of positive opportunities for these like poor Chinese people, but also interactions. So a lot of people don't understand that Chinese restaurants are safe spaces for lots of minorities. So Jewish Americans during uh, Christmas time, they go to Chinese restaurants. During their uh, birthdays, they go to Chinese restaurants. And so it is a space open to another ethnic group that you know lets them eat their food. And because it doesn't have that much dairy and they're open on Christmas, mm. it, becomes, and it becomes part of their modernity, right? And it's not in the history, and I want to write about one day, is the fact that African Americans were excluded in so many spaces in America, yeah. but not Chinese restaurants. Yeah. And so you have a lot of African Americans who just have these stories of going to Chinese restaurants, such as my Chinese restaurant in the Midwest, and having these like generational stories. And I think that those stories, I mean, yes, there were racism, but those other stories of like this massive um, kind of like safe space, I, mm -hmm. as you say, uh, those are not really told in the literature, and, and that's, so that's why I wanted to edit this book. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we, and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada. This is our second partnership with them. We are now going to be talking about American Chinese restaurants and so much more. We have Dr. Jenny Bond joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, Jenny. Hi. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk about your new book and much more. I want to start with some of the questions that we love asking our guests. Do you think that we're really all one? Um, well, Leslie White is a very famous anthropologi uh, anthropologist, and he talks about energy and how we all are f have different energies, right? But we're all part of the universe energy. So um, to some extent, I, I do believe that we're all interconnected and um, in terms of energy. Yeah, and, and I can send you positive energy, you can send me negative energy. There's like, I, I think that we are all connected energy. I, I believe that when you come into a room, your energy before you come into a room will affect the room subtly. And so I believe that all of us have energy wherever we go and people can feel it on a subconscious uh, level. So much of what you just said about energy is super present from the initial moments of whether you call it the Big Bang or creation or all that is or whatever you want to call it source until now and how this path of all coming from one until now has deep roots in interconnectedness. The air that I breathe in is the air phytoplankton and trees breathe out. I take a bite of an apple. It comes from the power of the sun. And so the, the lack of children understanding that, feeling separate rather than feeling interconnected, would you say that, that those feelings of separation, like what in, indigenous tribes from around the world are trying to remind modernity about, would you say that that's the root of many of our issues? 
I think there's many routes, but definitely the interconnectedness of nature is something that is a definite route of disconnected. And I would definitely say that our electronics is one of the things like social media, uh, the addiction to social media, and also the addiction to our electronics is, um, you know, part of that route of, of feeling you, making you feel disconnected. Um, I live in California with Silicon Valley. There's many uh, people who are spending multiple million dollars for you to stay on that app for as long as possible. Uh, and they're doing everything they can to keep you on that computer, on your computer, to, to like it. Uh, all these masterminds to make you feel, so it's for advertising to make more income for them. So that is, I think, one of the many routes, but definitely I would say like um, this new kind of, you know, e this new really huge change for humans that we're constantly connected in a way that makes us almost disconnected is one of the routes, so yes. Very interesting, yes. Yes, I, I like how you um, bring into the equation, um, especially on a time, time uh, scale um, visibility here, on the millions of years of human evolution, we're looking at just the very, very last 10 or so years of having these devices around mm -hmm. us and using them all the time, pulling at them 150 times a day, the business Hours. plans hours of our time, the business plans of the attention economy being tied to advertising. Um, this is a very also um, interesting thing. You know, being able to query civilization's knowledge at my fingertips is also very interesting. So um, th there's, um, I'm really excited for the next wave of, of conscious evolution that comes and builds the next ways that we connect with devices because mm -hmm. it will be much more around um, the interconnectedness and less so about um, profiteering on people's attention. Um, Jenny, I'm curious, what are your thoughts about the overall purpose of reality why are we here that's a deep question <laughs> yeah, we love asking the deep ones on the program why are we here yeah. i don't know if i can answer for everyone on earth i can only answer for myself yeah. um i think i'm here for a purpose i have my own motto and um i don't know about other people like why they're here um they probably have their own reasonings but my model is to create culture to use my uh, privilege and power to help um, oppressed uh, populations. Three, um, to create what I don't see. And mm -hmm. four, my last motto is reveal hidden stories. And so that's how why I'm here. And that's uh, from living my life. That's uh, my purpose. Uh, other people I don't know. They have. I'm sure they have their own purposes. Let's go through those again. Those were really good. Okay, you want to create culture. Create culture. Okay. Yeah. Number two. Uh, use my privilege and power to help oppressed po populations. Yeah, use privilege and power to help oppressed populations. We all have yeah. our, we yeah. are both privileged individuals um, in a Western space, yeah, uh, yeah. so here, right? Um, Where when we buy a cup of coffee, that same price is what 50% uh, of people around the world make in a day. Right, yeah. and yeah. we're not the Vietnamese coffee pickers. You're getting poisoned in Vietnam to make that coffee bean to send it to Starbucks, so yes. Uh, that is something. So that's what I can do um, in my own little way. Because these are our yeah. brothers and sisters around the world that we want to help uplift. These, this is us. We are yeah. one and working and feeling that um, rather than buying a third car, third house, third boat, watch, whatever. Investing it into the art and entrepreneurship and science and spirituality of people around the world to come up and be uplifted, bring their unique gifts forward. Right. I love that one. Okay, th three. Uh, was, uh, uh, what was, uh, so, create culture, use my phone in public, uh, what was it, uh, create what I don't see. So, uh, sometimes, um, I want to see things happen. I want to, uh, and it's, maybe this is kind of, uh, goes into the model minority myth for Asians, but if I don't see it, I'll create it. So, I believe I can create what I say. So, if I say yes. it, I can create it. And Love so, um, how else can you bring your unique gift to the world if it's you know if it's not there? You, we we have to manifest it. We have yeah. to see the next world that we're going to build and then build that. Yeah. So I've been wanting to be an anthropologist since I was eight years old. Yeah. So since I was eight years old, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see different cultures and 
because um, I, I watch a lot of Star Trek and um, <laughs> public <laughs> broadcasting, yeah. and so it was just like really fascinating. And so I, I could see those people creating culture, doing things, revealing hidden stories. My last one is it's revealing hidden stories, right? And so, yeah. it's particularly for um, PBS, right? I, I saw a show where they the interviewer interviewed a, a giant African tribe where they're very tall, and then the, he just drove like, you know, I guess 100 miles away, and it was a, a pygmy kind of shorter tribe, and I was like, how's this possible? You know, my eight-year-old self was like, oh my God, humans are so diverse, and it's so interesting, and then this kind of goes into my Star Trek love, in that it's really kind of an anthropology show in a way, and that it, re re it reveals a lot of different cultures, and kind of being tolerant and of these cultures, and how they have lots to lots of value, right? And so that's like, within all these four, it probably has something to do with my, my, my sci-fi uh, viewership. Yeah, well those are such four profound ones and I hope that um, those that are watching can also both relate to and resonate with some of the ones that you mentioned, because I sure do, and then also reflect on our own purposes. What is our unique role here in the world? And if we haven't really established that yet, the importance of like writing it down and really reflecting on it on a daily basis, what our unique gift is to bring to the world. So crucial. Um, let's dive in. This, this was really interesting learning about this about you. You did another interview and you sent it over to me and I was reading it. Mm -hmm. And when I was hearing about this, um, so you were born in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and then came here very young. Three months. Three months To old. the U.S. To the U.S. Yes, American citizen. Yes. yes, and then mm -hmm. you grew up in Bellevue. Illinois. In Illinois, yes. near Chicago. Yes, it's like a, over an hour away, yes. Okay. And suburbs. Suburbs. Yes. Working class suburbs, yes. And then um, you spent a lot of your time working in, the ch in a Chinese restaurant. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Interesting. And so then this kind of spurred part of at least a good chunk of this American Chinese restaurant's most uh -huh. recently anthropological study that you're doing uh -huh. um, of really this, like, uh, how in many ways uh, Chinese diaspora come into very interesting social communities around things like these restaurants, which mm -hmm. actually have, you were telling me, almost 50,000 mm -hmm. Chinese restaurants in the U.S.? More than McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's combined. That is yes. mind-blowing because we yeah. see those chain restaurants everywhere, mm -hmm. but we don't think about counting the, yeah. the Chinese. And there's all these different, the provinces in China have unique foods. Yeah. And so there's all this kind of stuff. Yeah. O over 13 regional like food cu cultures, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is so interesting. So take us to, um, even in, your, uh, in, the, in the childhood, what, is it, what was it like being a part of that, that node um, in Bellevue when you were growing up and then how it relates to what your studies are? today? So a lot of it, I, I think back now, but at the, as a child, I didn't understand. But as a child, I, you know, I worked in the restaurant, I was six, seven, eight, uh, and our customers were a primarily working class Anglos as well as African Americans, primarily African Americans. How were you doing this at six, seven, eight? Yeah, just take orders. You're yeah, taking orders? Yeah, just take was orders. Was it a family restaurant? Yeah, it was a family restaurant, Mom, yeah. dad, yes, like, ran yes, it? Yes, 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 yes. Because that's yeah. how you did it at six, seven, yeah, eight, taking orders. Yeah, of course, orders. yeah, like, of yeah, course. no problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I was a cultural broker, so my parents didn't speak English, and so I would translate for them, right? And I would you know, write down orders. And uh, it, it was, I didn't really, I only realized this now, but I would code switch and I would, I would translate that culture to my parents who, you know, cooked in the back. And I, I could understand how I had to change differently to each population that I served, right? So for African Americans, I was a certain way, Anglo Americans, um, just like kind of things that uh, you learn. Uh, and then, of course, I would switch my, my, I would switch my kind of like my personality to my parents. I'd have to be, you know, thoughtful and very within the Asian culture. I think similar to Armenian, you have to. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to say it, say it, but you have to be respectful yeah. of the family dynamic. Of your yeah. father has to be the, you know, the king, yeah. right? But it's a strange way to grow up because I had to translate for them. So I, in many cases, my father didn't speak English, and so I had to speak for him and do all these things. And not unlike a lot of immigrants around the world who have to be translators like you. You're a translator. You're a cultural broker. And mm -hmm. so I, I like grew up there. I like this word, cultural broker. Yeah. Inter it's so interesting that you're taking these orders and you're like dealing with one, uh, and it's not even one. It wasn't just the American melting pot. You were mm -hmm. dealing with a bunch of cultures, mm -hmm. um, taking their orders in English, mm -hmm. but a bunch of different cultures. And then you were 
doing a really, this is an interesting process for young kids especially to go through with the neuroplasticity that they have, their ability to switch all of what you just took in mm -hmm. to then, was it, was it Mandarin? Was it Cantonese? Cantonese. Cantonese. Yeah, so we're Cantonese, yeah. Interesting, so then you, tra you, yeah. you disseminated that in Cantonese. Yeah, <laughs> and then I went to Catholic school. Like Catholic school has its own regime, so uh, I would go to Catholic school every day, and you know, we'd go to church in the beginning and at night, and uh, it has its own cultural norms. Our teachers were nuns and priests, and so I had to change again for that, <laughs> for that environment, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're switching yeah. between environments like, like that at a young age. Yeah, that's yeah, really four different cultures a day, I guess. <laughs> and that will say. really quickly um, open up uh, a kid to uh, an understanding of uh, cosmopolitan dynamics, um, openness in general, um, trying to, uh, you learn uh, a lot more about uh, other people and walks of life, gain more empathy and insight into that, less xenophobia, these types of, these types of things. I don't think I realized as a child. I just, me, I, me I just switched. Likewise, just we never, we really never. You just change. That's how it is. You to become survive. like it's like yeah. mid twenties, thirties, thirty five, like mid thirties. Mm -hmm. You kind of realize these most profound things that happened to you when you were young that kind of mm -hmm. shaped. And then you like call your mom and dad or whatever, and you say like, thank you so much. Yeah, that yeah, that yeah. call did happen. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, I'm like, thank you, you worked so hard and yeah, yeah. you kind of instilled it in us, you know, a work yeah. ethic, yeah. So then, yeah. The, so then there was a dynamic there that was happening where it was kind of like uh, a, a central point to a, a Chinese community in Bellevue as well. There's no Chinese uh, community. None. No. There was zero. Oh, so shit. I was the only unicorn there. Yes, in the oh. school as well in the whole cities. Oh, in the whole school? Yeah, in the whole city as well. In the city? Yes, I've never seen of anyone. Over 10,000 yeah, yeah. people? Yeah, yeah. I've never seen anyone Asian until I was, uh, you know, later on, like seventh, eighth grade. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so it was. Wow. Yeah. So then feeling, I, I didn't realize this, right? And so I identify with African Americans because in the Midwestern, there's only two there's only Anglo or African American. And so. Cognitively, I, I kind of thought I was African American until first grade, <laughs> and I said, "Mom, I, we're black. I'm black." And she's like, "No, you're not black." And I was, she's like upset. I'm like, "But I, <laughs> I know I'm not like everyone else." But uh, she said, I, "You know, we're Cantonese." But uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, but I think this is a very common thing for Chinese restaurants in America, in that um, uh, you sort of you, ha your your clients are certain people, and then how you you navigate spaces and then you start identifying the people that you serve, so, mm. yeah. Well, okay, so then what was it that then made this, so now it, it kind of makes sense that you had this upbringing that catalyzed a, a lot of your interest in doing anthropological research on this specific thing, but now with these findings, I mean, this number is staggering in the first place, 50,000 Chinese restaurants in the U.S., that number is staggering. Well, all over the world, it's like one of the number one restaurants. It's not just America, it's all over the world there's Chinese restaurants, right? Yeah. Every country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, for example, I probably only recently became used to seeing, like, an Ethiopian restaurant or something mm, yeah. on, on the streets. And the food's incredible, but it's much less common, though, way right, less right. common. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, even me talking to someone recently about, like, German or Austrian food, right? Mm. And they were just like, well, what does that taste like? And yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. There's a, such a familiarity with Chinese food. Or, there know, is. Interesting. It's interesting. China's spending billions of dollars to push their hard cultural power around, you know, trying to do, develop their language schools all over the world. But in a way, their poorest members from China that are migrating around the world is, you know, by surviving and selling different Chinese food is like kind of providing soft cultural power in a way, yeah. Even though it's not directed by anybody, it's, but it's a way of, similar to Korean K-pop, like BTS, that's like Korean cultural uh, soft power, so. But that's kind of, you know, planned a little bit, but um, this is an unplanned kind of um, just cultural dissemination. Yeah, this was also an interesting um, point. Uh, you, you talk about it uh, like the relationship between food and society. Yes. I really like it phrased that way. Well, um, I think in, in order to understand a culture, you should learn the language and you should eat the food. And uh, I think these Chinese restaurants around the world, not just in America, but also in Canada, Mexico, because this book, American Chinese Restaurant, that's edited by myself and Hai Ming Lu, it's not just uh, a USA story. It's a, you know, it's a Latin American story. Chinese restaurants are all over Latin America, right? Uh, wow. It's a huge uh, restaurant. Uh, they have shaped and uh, 
impacted Peru, Argentina, uh, Chile, and these are not in the discourse. And um, so Alan, the reason why I also wanted to edit this book was because every time I read, as an academic, I would read these like stories of racism on Chinese you know, restaurateurs, you know, they weren't allowed, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act that excluded Chinese people from coming to the US. That's true, and, and all these things are right. And I would read these these things, and they would mention Chinese restaurants as the way how the restaurant workers, I'm sorry, the railroad workers, after they were done with the railroad, they couldn't go back, go back to China, so they started Chinese restaurants. And I thought that was an interesting story, and definitely wow. interesting. But I, having ra been raised in a Chinese restaurant, knew that there are so many other stories of positive opportunities for these like poor Chinese people, but also interactions. So a lot of people don't understand that Chinese restaurants are safe spaces for lots of minorities. So Jewish Americans during uh, Christmas time, they go to Chinese restaurants. During their uh, birthdays, they go to Chinese restaurants. And so it is a space open to another ethnic group that you know lets them eat their food. And because it doesn't have that much dairy and they're open on Christmas, mm. it, becomes, and it becomes part of their modernity, right? And it's not in the history, and I want to write about one day, is the fact that African-Americans were excluded in so many spaces in America, yeah. but not Chinese restaurants. Yeah. And so you have a lot of African-Americans who just have these stories of going to Chinese restaurants, such as my Chinese restaurant in the Midwest, and having these like generational stories. And I think that those stories, I mean, yes, there were racism, but those other stories of like this massive um, kind of like safe space, I, I, mm -hmm. as you say, uh, those are not really told in the literature. And, and that, so that's why I wanted to edit this book. 20 okay. chapters, it was like a lot of chapters. Yeah, yeah. All over the world, yeah. Well, so that's a really interesting um, nuance and actually a point that, again, like you're describing, is not necessarily highlighted, especially uh, in terms of like mainstream news of so few people are going to want to talk about this, this space for, for the Chinese restaurant for Jewish people, for African Americans to be able to come and enjoy um, uh, at times when maybe they couldn't uh, otherwise. And that's really nice, and then that's probably only one of so many other examples. Yeah. Of yeah, so give us these other examples. Well, in uh, Latin America, right, um, the, it's a, the, there's lots of people, it's a high population, but it's also a working class population. And so, particularly in Chile and Peru and um, different spaces, they actually um, provide a cheap, affordable, and delicious food source for masses of people, right? And so that is something often not talked about, how the price point of Chinese food is actually not expensive, right? I mean, there's higher ones that uh, Hyming Lee talks about in uh, P.F. Chang's, it's like a nicer brand, and there's like all these very high, high restaurants in Hong Kong and Shanghai, but in Latin America, all over are inexpensive, like in the United States, like in Canada, are inexpensive, relatively, right, in others, and that provides a lot of people food at a great entertaining price, a low price, and particularly for students, and yeah. the work, and that's mass, it's kind of like ramen, it's like, top, you know, cup of noodles, it's like, it mass feeds a lot of people, and mm. that's what it's done, it's, it's really, um, mm. and it's, it's kind of giving it a taste of, you know, globalization to people in, uh, uh, I guess, the Caribbean islands, you know, Mm. Uh, it, Chinese food and of course Africa another way there's a lot of Chinese restaurants now in Africa that are mm. you know soft power of I don't think it's intentional but you know they're surviving in these different African countries with Chinese restaurants yeah Whoa. So another part of this is these more uh, on the end of more affordable prices that also feed quite a lot. So you can have the collegiate students or you can have um, people that gain the ability for, you know, $10 an entree, U.S. dollars here in the States for an entree can maybe even share that amongst yeah. like two people or have half of it at home later or whatever and get a taste of the cuisine as well. Yeah. That's an interesting point too. Kind of a globalization. You know, they feel yeah. that they're experiencing another culture. It gives them yeah. a different thing. Yeah. Y yet another part of this is um, the actual community that's formed around the Chinese restaurant itself in terms of um, the dynamics of uh, if this is like like in this example, maybe in like for your mom and dad, for them starting their restaurant, there were no really other Chinese people in Bellevue. Mm -hmm. Yet, um, it's interesting to think about these other pockets where the restaurant, that Chinese restaurant, actually maybe became like a hub 
and mm -hmm. sometimes for other families to come. Yeah, um, definitely. Chinese families, and you guys could meet and like get to know each other then. We didn't have that experience, but I've, I've read about those people. My cousins lived in another state, uh, Missouri. We, we rarely saw them, but when we saw them, they also owned a Chinese restaurant. Um, I yeah. think it can be a hub for, I've, I've read, you know, for other Chinese I, I didn't experience that myself, but um, yes, a lot of Chinese restaurants have double menus. And so- What's that? A double menu is, um, there's a rest, there's a menu for Anglo-Americans, which would be like orange chicken, broccoli and beef, and these are things that are not found in China. I was just about yes. to ask you this question next. <laughs> They're the, not found in yeah, China. The yeah, the cuisine difference is big. Yeah. Because this is very Americanized. It is Americanized, Chinese food, Canadianized, yeah. Because yeah. um, we don't have a, like Beijing kao ya, like I loved yes. it when I was there, but we don't have that. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 Beijing roast duck, we don't. Okay. Or we don't, like really, in, I've never eaten at a Chinese restaurant in the U.S. where it's been like, you know, Beijing roast duck is on the, <laughs> you know. I'm sure, I've, I think like, you went to Panda Express, I assume. Do they have roast duck at Panda no, Express? No, 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 no. It's like a oh, chain. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no, it's super, like those ones you were just listing was uh -huh. that, and I love like the more authentic, like. Yeah. Like uh, uh -huh. tr uh, tripe was another one. The cow stomach was mm -hmm. another one with peanut sauce on it. Yeah. There's like a bunch of interesting varieties that are totally not on. So that yet. would be on the Chinese menu. Oh, the it, double. The menu. double menu. <laughs> and so um, the American menu would, would be orange chicken, right? And there's no orange chicken in China. That's an invention in America. And fortune cookies. There's no fortune cookies in China. None? <laughs> the, not one, not, not one, one in China. It's, so there's, they would, uh, Jennifer Lee wrote a great book on that. Great, wonderful TED Talk, which talks about chop suey. Right? Chop suey is a bit. But chop suey just literally means leftovers, right? And so they're serving this thing to survive in America called chop suey. It's called leftovers, right? And mm -hmm. so that's a thing. Chop suey means leftovers? It does mean leftovers. So you say, oh, if you go to China, you're like, can I have some leftovers? They're like, what? But there's so many Americans who love chop suey, right? And they say, oh, can I have chop suey? And, and I've noticed in Canada, they have this thing called uh, Chinese pie, which is equivalent to just shepherd's pie, which is just oh, potato yeah, on top. Yeah. But they call it Chinese pie. Uh -huh. And it's not from China, potatoes are not from China. Chinese people don't rarely eat beef because that's their number one worker. Why do you want to eat your worker? Like India, you don't want to eat your work. So they don't really serve beef. And then, so there's no, this Canadian Chinese pie is not Chinese. And so it's, yeah, it's, that's the, the double menu, yes. And yeah. uh, broccoli has never been grown ever in China. So Broccoli's never been grown no, in China. No, no, they have their own broccoli. They have Chinese broccoli. That's a long stalk. The long stalk. Yes, I remember that those. is Chinese those broccoli. Those were really yeah. good. I like those. They don't yeah. have the broccoli's from Italy. They don't have yeah. the little guys. They don't the have little the little guys. Thick, little yeah. Thick broccoli pieces. Yeah, so that in itself is interesting. I think one, at Chinatown was next to Little Italy at one point in New York, so mm. maybe that, I don't know the origin, but oh, something must have happened where they started this, yeah. because Chinese food in America is used with American ingredients, right? So it's American ingredients, right? Americans love fried and crispy things with lots of sugar on it, and so those are American palate points, right? And then they love beef in a huge, huge quantity, and then broccoli, <laughs> so yeah, that's a, those are American items, so it's kind of like, I, I was, I'm kind of wondering if you're going to ask me about authenticity. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is where this con this is where this part of the conversation is for sure heading. It's interesting when you're talking about designing for this palette. Well, um, as much as you know, loving you know fried foods and having like sugar, like orange chicken, basically, Just, right? Yes. Just, it also oh. kind of it also kind of like reminds me of like, you know, if you ever. Um, Maybe you're like fasted for you know a couple hours, or if not, maybe even quite a bit. You've intermittently been fasting, and then you eat um, a vegetable of some sort, even like a carrot or a tomato, whatever you eat, right? You eat some sort of vegetable, even a spinach leaf. It really doesn't matter. When you eat it, your palate is like so. Um, there's been a delay with the fast that your palate almost tastes the sh it tastes the sugar in mm. the actual vegetable, right? It tastes how mm -hmm. sweet the carrot is or the tomato, the spinach leaf, etc. And training our palates to respect that is very important. If we want to live healthy uh, on a day-by-day -day basis, if we want to live with a good lifespan as well and a health span, both of those things. And also just, I mean, you can really just 
it's a good way to do this experiment is to take something like, you know, a piece of chocolate or something, mm -hmm. and take that piece of, uh, ch after you eat the first spinach leaf, right? You mm -hmm. ate that, you tasted how sweet that was. Then you take the piece of chocolate, you know, put that on your palate and try that. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, wow, that was so much sweeter. And then if you go to the spinach leaf afterward and you taste the spinach leaf, it doesn't taste sh sweet at all. Right. And so it's because uh -huh. we have this, yeah, this long process of, yeah. Training our taste buds towards these things that we can also repattern our behaviors um, towards more healthy decisions. So I, I, I appreciate you pointing that out because it also um, hopefully enlightens us to um, to because you know how do you feel after you eat a plate of orange chicken versus how do you feel when you have you know more more vegetable on your plate yeah. and um, and I mean those are really interesting comparisons but. Yeah, so the authenticity is also a big one because, um, you know, just coming back uh, from China in September, I oh, wow. <laughs> loved, <laughs> loved the food, the hospitality Where in was China? incredible. Spent lots of time in Beijing, spent time in oh. Hangzhou, oh, wow. spent okay. a little bit of time in Shanghai. Okay. Loved it, loved it. And interviewing uh, professors at Peking University and Hung in, uh, Westlake University in Hangzhou oh, just wow. was lots and lots of fun. And it was um, the, the level of... Uh, immersion into Chinese culture at the most like deepest roots root level of the psyche of the philosophies mm -hmm. of that type of stuff is very important instead of seeing like the worst thing to do is just to look at like mainstream news and take some sort of a distorted image of what a whole thousands of years of culture actually is mm -hmm. um, so that's probably a big takeaway that I make but also just um, like that actually speaks to authenticity as well in terms of just people themselves like you know I would never just try and like like walk into whatever even if it's a Chinese restaurant or if it's any uh, culture's restaurant and just try and come in with a, an, an image of what that restaurant is based on mainstream media versus mm -hmm. based on my own experiential ability to ask you questions about who you are yeah. um, where you come from what the culture is mm -hmm. what you love to do in life what your deepest thoughts are about the nature of this reality so there's always a better way to get to um, what I think are the roots of people rather than what looks like distorted images in yeah. the media sphere. So if um, something I talked to a uh, chef, who, it's a chapter in the book, I interviewed a uh, chef, um, Martin Yan, and he, we talked about authenticity a lot. Because that's always the critique of uh, these Chinese restaurants around the world, that they're not authentic, they're not in China, they're not, um, they're kind of these orange chicken, you know, fortune cookie things made up, right? But I think we both agree that these places were s places of survival, and so these uh, different communities, um, this is what the people wanted to eat. They do not want to eat cow tongue, right? Or the stomachs, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what they had to serve in order to survive. And uh, oh, and yeah. a lot of times they didn't work, uh, they didn't get paid. Our, like for instance, I was never, my sister and I, we were never paid, right? We just worked for our parents all the time. Yes, yes. They, and my, my, sister, my mother was also working there, she also didn't get paid. And so you're doing this to survive. And so that is what your clientele wants. And so that's what you have. And, mm. and I respect my parents were doing this. Um, they didn't have a culinary background. They just went into the Mid Midwest and opened a restaurant. And so, but it enabled us to survive. Um, I have a, a PhD, all my cousins who have, um, they all have doctors and, and mm. uh, upper degrees. And all of our family members are, well, some of them were Chinese restaurant wor workers and owners. And so, enabled us to survive into the next uh, next uh, generation. So. Yes. Do you see other sorts of um, macro trends around um, the way that uh, during diasporic moments that uh, f families create restaurants, what they know, they know their food. So they make the restaurant so that they can use it as a mechanism of survival mm -hmm. and also sharing culture. Yeah. Is that like a frequent macro? I think so. Yeah. It's like, a, it's kind of, I think Jennifer Lee talked about it. Chinese food is like a free app that everyone can get. Yeah. And, and it's spread like Linux, it's like everywhere. Um, it, I mean, over 50,000, that's a lot of restaurants, yeah. right? And so um, that's something, I think being Chinese, that's your cultural right. You have your cultural right to your food. And so that's something you know, right? You know your language, your food, and that's something that you could, I don't want to call it sell, but 
it's something that you can use to survive. And I think that's, yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah. yeah. It is definitely a macro trend that people, um, I, I don't understand. But I was going to say that a lot of these Chinese people, it's a way of coming home to this imagined of homeland because to be honest, all these Chinese people around the world, the global diaspora, so, so if we're saying 60 to 70% of the earth is Asian, let's say 20, almost 23% of the earth is Chinese, right? So almost one in four people, or at least, you know, 20%. When you eat Chinese food, you can eat an imagined homeland, right? So yeah. there's like some energy level um, of taste that you can, you know your grandmother ate those, you know, Armenian, uh, um, items and then she loved it and then your father ate you ate it so you you feel this like connection and i think that yes i it's definitely agree it's like some sort of macro spreading but with kind of a, a homeland feel yes <laughs> this is again in the ability of the person that um not only yeah um goes and has the moment of wanting to provide what their um, culture uh can uh bring to the area that they move to, but also the person that comes um, from that local area to experience that culture and their food. You made this clear at the very beginning too, is that you, you learn a bit of the language, learn a bit of the food, ask good questions. Don't just come to this um, restaurant without inquiry into the deeper levels of the roots of the people and the culture and wanting mm -hmm. to learn, because it's a missed opportunity to learn. Yeah. And if we mm -hmm. can instill that curiosity in children to want to learn, even at mm -hmm. the level of just a restaurant, when they go and they learn about the food and they learn about the culture, et cetera, it'll make it so that the world becomes more of that one community. That, Definitely. Yeah. Um, I also... I also, want, I also want to ask you this question because given the amount of, I don't know if there's been study into this, given the amount that um, small, medium-sized businesses around the world are, yes, some are coming up, but most of them are going away due mm -hmm. to um, uh, the increased amount of massive corporations taking um, mm -hmm. stock in um, their ability to uh, deliver uh, groceries deliver restaurant food mm -hmm. soon it's already being tested to be done by autonomous cars and robots and drones right. and all different types of um, delivery mechanisms like that um, given that do you foresee something also occurring or has there been any study with that number of 50,000 restaurants potentially and that's just in the US but around the world slowly potentially declining and needing to find other work and all this other kind of stuff I would say absolutely not for Chinese food. Number one, Chinese food, the price point, you can't reproduce it for that price point with a machine, right? Um, the, the how Chinese restaurants work is a lot of unpaid labor, right? And a lot of, and it's down the line how they get their items and it's how, all- How do they, if there's unpaid labor, how do those people uh, live if they're unpaid? Well, their like family, yeah, their family. Like I, I wasn't paid. <laughs> but it, only family, because then, because then the mm -hmm. father, although you're unpaid, pays for the rent and right, the, uh, right, yeah, and, yeah, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so okay. I, I, I don't see a machine because if we, if you actually really paid people what they work, right? The the prices for a Chinese restaurant, those items like orange, even orange chicken would be triple the price, right? Even in reproducing it in a in a form that is mass produced will never be the same, I don't want to say quality, but that, I don't want to say authenticity, but that traditional recipe cannot be reproduced, right? Um, what you had in Beijing cannot be reproduced in a mass Swanson, right, or something, you know? And I, I just don't see it happening because, um, particularly I think just Chinese people are very hardworking, as all people are, but they're very, uh, they will go, they will, uh, they, I, I don't see it. I, I think that no machine can reproduce a traditional, there's like, you know, over 12 food cultures in China. They can, cannot, I, I don't see, I don't see it. Yeah. And, and for I, that. I do, which is interesting. Real interesting. I, I, okay. I see, I see nothing. Oh, <laughs> I see nothing. The, the, uh -huh. the area of what human expertise has uh, advantage uh, over mm -hmm. AI and automation, mm -hmm. robotics, that area is very rapidly decreasing. Mm. Um, and I, uh, I, I do foresee mm. some people being able to like 
you know, grapple on for like the last couple of like these decades that are that it's coming. Mm -hmm. But even then, um, I like it's pretty clear to me that um, within a hundred years, the definition of like work is oh. going to be so much different. There's going to be just oh, yeah. there's going to be a lot more. Um, uh, one could say like art or play yeah. or um, that kind of, and oh, this is in the most brightest possible future. There's lots of other right. futures where there's, uh, you know, bifurcation based on socioeconomic status of people, mm -hmm. um, but the ones that own the AI and the automation and the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's got to be a, a heart centric consciousness evolution that we focus on where we uplift all of us and we distribute the mm -hmm. fruits of the emerging technologies yeah. so that way everyone has their ability to bring unique gifts forth live a prosperous peaceful dignity oriented yeah. and driven life and hopefully have AI robotics automation just augment um, for now uh, until we then decide what is the next evolutionary step after that which in many ways could be um, what the what humanity is, a biological mm -hmm. bootloader for that next uh, step of a digital style super mm -hmm. intelligence. I hope you're right in that we're all uplifted. That's and the that we part. all, yeah. everyone, yeah, gets yes. the fruits of AI, yeah. Yes, yes, this is paramount. Yeah. Yes. This is paramount, yes. yes. I'm yeah. happy we agree on okay. that. <laughs> I, love it. I love it, I'm happy that we agree on that. I wanna um, ask you this too, Jenny. So, um, you have a passion for helping first generation college students with their barriers and bridges to college success, specifically Southeast Asian American. Mm -hmm. And you were teaching me about this. This is really, really important um, given so much of people moving, like diaspora, moving across the planet and then trying to seek uh, a, 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 being able to actually bring their unique gifts forth. Um, there are barriers, there are challenges to, that obstacles to overcome. How have you seen that process and been able to catalyze assistance with that and help? Um, as I mentioned, I was a, I was a Chinese little eight-year-old uh, cultural broker like you. And, uh, and so even, one could argue a professor is a cultural broker. And so one of the things I've realized being Asian American, a type of tribe in, <laughs> or I don't know, because I guess I could be part of the human tribe, whereas 70% of humans are Asian or the, all humans, you know, 100%. But um, Asian Americans in particular, I don't know the Canadian situation, but Asian Americans in America uh, are called the model minority. And they're called the model minority because on aggregate, they have the highest uh, graduate uh, graduation rates in college, over 55%, right? So 55% of all Asian Americans have a college degree. Wow. And within that, you have like South Indians and Taiwanese Americans that have an 80% graduation rate with additional um, uh, graduate deg degrees, like PhDs, uh, uh, doctors, lawyers, et cetera. And, so, and also as an aggregate, uh, Asian Americans have the highest income in terms of making over uh, 60,000, 70,000 a year, which is quite a lot in comparison to the average American, right? So if you look at that number, you think, oh, Asian Americans, they're the model minority. They're doing wonderful, doing great, right? But when you disaggregate the numbers, you actually see that it's, um, it's actually not correct, not true at all, because Number one, Asian Americans, a lot of them don't speak English and they don't fill out these census forms. Asian Americans live in uh, multi-family uh, multi households. So if 17 people are making 2,000 a year, that's still gonna show up more than you know, one person with a nuclear family, right? And of course, a lot of those people will not even report their income, right? And so mm. the numbers are incorrect. But in particular, if you look at Southeast Asians, um, the Hmong, the Mien, the Kamu, uh, Cambodians, Filipinos, Vietnamese, and also low-income Chinese, Japanese, um, uh, Vietnamese uh, people, uh, Americans, they actually are in high poverty rates where 70% of them report um, uh, having a traumatic food or um, poverty-ridden uh, situation where they could not, um, they could not uh, you know, help themselves if they had a big th issue, right? And so particularly for Southeast Asians, they have one of the lowest graduation rate with around 11 to 14, which is much lower than um, the American national average. <laughs> yeah, this is an important <laughs> breakdown. It takes something that's viewed as a, like you said, a model minority group, 
and it breaks it down. And there are some incredible practices that happen. People coming over with motivation and determination and perseverance and grit to get to, to actualize those gifts and want to. So there's some great things there. But when you do, you know, open that up, double click in, look at the breakdowns, um, there is some serious um, issues that have happened with um, with uh, specific pe peoples as a diaspora coming to other par parts of the world where there is, many of the time, diaspora comes from some sort of a violence or war or, you know, these, yeah. Yes, genocides. Genocides, yes. Come, yes. And, then, and then trauma is, is there from through family, lineages, and then we're carrying that trauma with us that needs to be healed and we need to evolve and grow through that and uh, heal it and... Um, yes. Otherwise, uh, we have a uh, we have a, a, we have this we have this feeling that comes when we encounter other, uh, other humans where there's just something that is um, it's it's not whole it's not oh, it's not full hearted there's still something there and and but then there's all this like closed offness with the process of trying to heal it it's got to be the right person at the right time with the right circumstances right. and all this type of stuff so how do we catalyze environments as frequently as we see chinese restaurants mm -hmm. why don't we have holistic healing centers and that would same, be great that i would love that that's a social fabric i want to build you know that's what we Thank want to, that's what we want to envision that would be wonderful for you to <laughs> build that why is we we will do it because mm -hmm. Why is it that on the streets there are so many options for food, but so little places for our emotions? Mm -hmm. It's a disaster that that's like that. Our emotions mm -hmm. have taken the most absolute backseat place in the economic machinery. Now, instead of being able to talk with someone about uh, the tr true, most visceral feelings at my deep depths of my psyche, now I like, you know, and this is a trusted person. Now uh, I'm concerned, but, but when I, you know, pay a therapist to try and like make sure that they're not like self-dealing when they also want to prescribe me a pharmaceutical and there's all this type of, you know, in indigenous people are trying to be like wake up, wake up, heal, heal. There are processes mm -hmm. of healing that we've been doing for millions of years and that can be leveraged for um, making it so that these breakdowns of minority groups that you're talking about that um, aren't as this, uh, uh, don't have 60,000 plus dollar a year salaries, um, that they themselves can actually uh, heal and then can achieve their unique gifts that they can bring to the world. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really happy that you bring that up as well. That's a really interesting point. So um, American Chinese Restaurants, Society, Culture, and Consumption mm -hmm. is out. Yes. It's available. The link's in the bio below. It's in, on Amazon, Walmart, um, but Amazon is probably the easiest place to get it. <laughs> link in the bio below. Um, Jenny, I want to ask you another question. One more. Okay. <laughs> what do you think is most beautiful? What a lovely last question. Hmm. What is that? You've been asking a lot of these, what is the most? So what, a, uh, what is the most beautiful? Mm. There's so many things that are beautiful. Um, hmm. Well, I've, I think that things in nature are very beautiful. I don't know about the most again, like what is the most, right? Um, I think nature is very beautiful. Um, being in nature, things that all around me are in a forest, those are truly beautiful places like Yosemite, where I'm, I live very close to, are very beautiful. Um, so those are beautiful things and you feel like the forest can heal you. It's been there for thousands of years and I think those are very beautiful. And then if you're with your family in the forest, then I, you're also gonna feel even more beautiful. So um, I, I, I really like nature. And um, those, I think that area, nature with your family, I think those are beautiful moments, yeah. Yes, yes. 
we highly recommend people to visit uh, Vancouver as well. British Columbia, I mean, oh. like looking across uh, towards n North Vancouver here. Uh, it's the beautiful. The mountains and the ocean and the trees, I mean, it all speaks. It all speaks and communicates. Um, the energy. The energy. It's energy. Yeah. It's good energy. It tells you that you're not alone, that you're actually part of thousands of years. And, yes. you know, your problem might be big to you now, but I'm a tree and I'm hundreds of years old. <laughs> I'm thousands of years old. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. And it's all so deeply interconnected. And just to remember to embody that interconnection and unconditional love, deep presence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, this has been such a great interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for asking coming me. on the program. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> yeah, you're super welcome. Thanks for all your great work. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. On all of the cool things that Jenny was teaching us, let us know your thoughts. Check out the links in the bio below to Jenny's work. Also, check out the links in the bio below to American Chinese restaurants. You can use the code as well in the bio below. Check that out. And also s check out the links in the bio below to the American Anthropological Association and support them, support their incredible annual meeting. And support simulation so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to great places like AAA's annual meeting and conducting these epic partnership interviews. You can find us on PayPal, Patreon, Cryptocurrency, all those links are in the bio below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you soon. Peace. That's a wrap. Oh, okay. Good job. Thank you so much. Good job. Oh, good, job. Okay. good job. Good job. Good job.